it's my great honor to introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. Scott Harley. So, Dr. Harley just retired like three months ago. Congratulations for your for the new chapter for your life. And before his retirement, uh, uh, Dr. Harley is a project uh, leader of the Read Reading Program in Colorado State for almost like 22 years, uh, plus like six more years in the South Dakota State where he, where he started his like, uh, uh, professional career. So I think like three members probably can, can capture his great achievement, right? So first is like on average, like two read varieties for every three years released by him. And because uh, we know, all know that the breeding cycle, right? So this number really means a lot. And the second is that almost like a million dollars annual loyalty back to the Colorado State because of one pattern he invented. And also like uh, there are like so high, over 100 publications in different topics or in the read, reading in the uh, genetics from like disease resistance and the user quality and so on and so forth. So with all this achievement, right, it's not surprised that he was named the fellow of ASA and the CSSA at the same time in 2010. He, he is also the recipient for the Global Science Research Award in 2020, last year. So, so actually, when I, uh, when, I, when I learned that I will be introduced to Dr. Harry, I listened to a few like podcast, interviewing podcasts for him. Like the two interesting things caught my attention. First is that Dr. Uh, Dr. Harry indicates that when he was young, he had no idea that he will be a good reader of his professional career. So, okay, but it turn, turns out he, he did well as well, yeah, beyond the well. And the second point, like when he, when he gave a, a suggestion for the new generation, he said that leading, uh, learning on the job to embrace the challenges, embrace new technologies. I think both echo well with this the title today, the only constant in life is change. So without further ado, I will turn the time over to you, Dr. Scott Hanley. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that marvelous introduction, Jen Ran. I really appreciate that. It was a pleasure to meet you before, and I look yeah. forward to any interactions that we may have in the future. Sure. Yeah. So, um, it's, it's really uh, wonderful for me to be here, to uh, be able to share some of what we've done here over the years at Colorado State University. When uh, Jen Ming asked me to do this, I said, why me? I mean, I'm retired and, and, and uh, he didn't hold that against me. He thought that maybe you might have some interesting perspectives to share. And so that's what I tried to do today. You know, one of the one of the things that when, you, when you've been around a few years is that uh, you know, your perception of things and, and how you, uh, how you uh, look back at your career and things that you did, they're a little bit you know, more in focus than they were in all those different years where you were living through it all. And so what I'm trying to do today is, is to try to look how things changed for, for us in our, in our program over the years. And then maybe towards the end, try to sum up some things and maybe some take home lessons for us. So, so uh, before we get into the meat of the presentation, I'd like to just give you a very, very brief uh, overview of, of our breeding program and uh, some of the things that the program has worked on. And, and if I say our breeding program, bear with me because I've, I've only been retired a couple of months. So I'm not that far separated uh, from it yet. So the, the, the meat of the presentation here will be to talk about change and, and how things changed in our program over time mm -hmm. in a lot of different ways from, uh, you know, people I won't talk about so much today, but, uh, you know, um, you know, perspectives, uh, how, how, how my thoughts about genetic gain changed over the years. Technology was a really big part of that in terms of genomics and doubled haploids and, and a lot of these things I'll talk about. And, um, and so th this notion that the only constant in life is change. I mean, you know, when, when, you know, the 27 years I was in my career, I didn't really have a very good appreciation for that as it was happening. But now that it's over, I, I, I think it's all coming into a little bit better focus. So, so I'll wrap things up with maybe some closing thoughts about 
about the specific things that changed in our program, as well as maybe some some more take home, take homes, maybe for some of the the younger breeders. So, so before I start, I wanted to uh, just show this slide because one of the one of the highlights of my life and my career was has been to get to know all of my predecessors. And uh, CSU's wheat breeding program started in 1963, a couple couple or a few decades after it started in Kansas or Nebraska. And uh, Bird Curtis uh, began the program back in 1963. He was here a very short time, turned over the reins to Jim Welsh, who was here a little bit longer, and then turned it over to my mentor, Jim Quick, who's, who you see down there at the bottom uh, left part of the slide there. And uh, you know, when I think of each of these three, right, I, I think about the things that they did in their programs. And I'm, I'm really not maybe a very effective student of, of history, but, um, but I, I think about the things that, that they did with the technologies that they had, had in the day. I mean, we, we talk about you know, implementation of you know, bringing computers into breeding, bringing plot combines into breeding, bringing Mexican wheat germplasm into breeding. And uh, I, th I think back with, with uh, a lot of reverence about the work that they accomplished over the X number of years that they were leading the program. So I came on board here in 1999 and I stepped down just at the end of, end of this past year. And I've turned the reins over to Eston Mason, who's, who you see down there in the bottom right. This photo was taken this past summer. Both of us have our masks on. And uh, so I, I think about the changes that, that, that uh, that uh, I was involved with over the years, as well as my predecessors. And I, I, I'm excited for the future that uh, the program that Eston's going to be able to lead over the, uh, over the next number of years. So uh, this is a map and I think maps are always very telling for us, but this shows where, where wheat is grown in the US. And I was looking at this earlier and just kind of noticing there's not one single dot there in Iowa. And so uh, you have to get your get going on that. But um, in any case, we grow different kinds of wheat in the U in the U.S. Spring wheat, winter wheats, hard wheats, soft wheats, Durham wheat, and and these are kind of geographically separated. There's some areas of overlap, but for us here in Colorado, this is what we have considered, what I have considered as our kind of our, our target environment, what we call the High Plains region of the Great Plains. And um, having, having said that, over, over time, things have changed with regards to how our varieties are marketed. And so our varieties today are marketed all the way from Texas up to Washington State. And so uh, really, I never expected that to happen. And, and that's maybe one other lesson about breeding is just this idea of serendipity and, and learning things and finding out new things that you had no idea were going to happen. So in any case, that's where we have focused our efforts over the years in terms of breeding targets. Um, this is what I would call our most important objectives here over the last number of years, uh, grain yield, right? And I'll show you a slide about that in, in a couple of minutes, but grain yield is, is uh, is breeding objective number one, number two, and number three, because the farmers will not accept a new variety uh, unless it yields more than the one that they're growing. And, and I've got a, quite a number of lessons that could reinforce that. And so here in Colorado, we're a very dry environment, being kind of stuck up against the mountains. And so uh, year in and year out, that yield is determined by drought stress and, and drought stress tolerance of the varieties. So uh, milling and baking quality is also very important. And, um, and the things that we've done over the last 20 odd years here have, have really brought these two things together. And that's probably one of the things that, that I, I feel best about the work that we've done. And I, I won't talk a whole lot about quality today. That would be a whole nother seminar. Um, so like with any crop then too, we've got a number of disease and, and insect problems and that has changed. And I'll talk about that here, but Right at present, our most important problems would be stripe rust that you see there. And I'll talk about that here in a little bit. And then the wheat stem sawfly, which is a, a newer problem for us. And I'll talk about that more in some detail. And then towards the latter part of the presentation, I'll talk about wheat streak mosaic virus. So, so we have a fungal pathogen, we have a viral pathogen, we have an insect. And, and then again, that viral pathogen is vectored by by a, uh, a, a different arthropod. It's not an insect, but the mite. So it's quite a diversity of, of different kinds of problems that we have to deal with in the breeding program. 
So I'll deal with most of these here from, from here on out. So over time, these are the varieties that our program uh, has released. And you know, when I came to CSU, you see here over here on the left slide, we breed, we breed hard red winter wheats, hard white wheats. And uh, you see over here on the hard red, the last one that was released by my predecessor, Jim Quick, was Prairie Red back in 1998. So everything to the right-hand side of that first column were varieties that were released since I took over the program in 1999. And the objectives and the scope of the program never got smaller, it only got bigger. Uh, I think the first edition or the first two editions were the addition of hard white wheat, that I'll talk about in a little bit. And we've had a number of different successes there. Clear field wheat is um, imidazolinone tolerant wheat. And uh, we were the first program to release uh, IMI wheat or clear field wheat in the world back in 2001. Um, and uh, we've had a number of other successes with that over the years. We then at CSU, we developed our own proprietary or our, our own uh, patented form of herbicide tolerance. Uh, ACCA's tolerance, and that has been dubbed uh, coaxium. And so that was another breeding objective that, that came along. So given that we developed the trade at CSU, and I'm one of the four patent holders on that, we were the first ones to bring the varieties to market back in 2017. And then last but not, not least, wheat stem soft fly. This is um, uh, something that we got going here at CSU, and I think really this is what's going to uh, rule my my successor's life over the next X number of years. So, so um, that kind of in a nutshell is maybe a little bit of history on the varieties. Anybody who like to learn more, there's a, a program uh, website. We uh, we have an online database where farmers or extension agents can can query variety trial data. Um, Plains Gold is the brand under which all, all of our varieties are marketed. And then there's a website there for the coaxium wheat production system. Okay, so what have we accomplished over the last X number of years? If we go back to this slide here, BACA wheat being Colorado State's first wheat back in 1973. These trial data here in these light green boxes come from head-to-head -head comparisons. On that, uh, on that variety database website. And uh, in, in essence, not to get into too much of the detail here, but if we set BACA in 1973 is kind of the zero uh, spot, but over X number of decades, 450 odd years here, we've added maybe 16 bushels, maybe 50% yield uh, for producers. It has not been a linear uh, path. Sometimes you go up, sometimes you go down. Uh, there have been a lot of failures along the way, not only from uh, our, our own efforts under my direction, but from the efforts of my successors. If a, if, a, if a breeder is successful with every variety that they've released, either they're lying to you or, or they just haven't released very many varieties. And so, uh, so in any case, some of these others are, are some landmark varieties. Akron, I'll, I'll mention briefly. Hatcher was kind of our first big one. And... Um, Hatcher was like eight years in a row, the number one planted wheat in Colorado and pretty popular in Western Kansas, and then Bird and Langan. So, so we've made gains and, and um, genetic gains over this period of time. This, I guess the sad part of it is, is it's really probably not much more than 1%, and, right? And so we, we have to do better than that going forward. So let's talk a little bit about breeding objectives now. And uh, where I wanted to start with is an insect pest uh, called the Russian wheat aphid. And this was an introduced insect pest back in the late 1980s. I remember being a graduate student here and remembering how everybody was so upset about this new insect pest. And, and my predecessor, really a, a testament to his creativity, he developed a resistant variety in seven years time and that had never been done up to that point. Um, but in any case, this is a problem. We had no resistance in the program. The program had worked an awful lot uh, over time and then even under my direction in my early years using largely uh, you know, a phenotypic screen in a greenhouse, what we call the insectary, where you know, aphids are dropped onto, you know, we had you know, expertise from the entomology team in support of that, but um, we were able to apply aphids to seedlings 
And then it was pretty easy to score which ones are resistant, right? It's, it's dead versus alive. And so it was a pretty easy screen for us to, to use. And we would do thousands of these every year. I think this photo was taken back in 2002, 2003. And, and you have to remember that the development of mark, DNA marker technologies, they weren't there yet. So we relied on the phenotype very heavily. And uh, about the time that I came to CSU, um, I mentioned earlier this variety Akron. In, in 2000, 2001, Akron was our most popular wheat variety grown in Colorado on about 25% of the acreage. And, and uh, my predecessor had begun a program of back crossing a, re, a Russian wheat aphid resistance gene into that, which we released in 2002. And this is a photo uh, from an irrigated trial location. It was a beautiful variety. And, uh, and, and it was, a, this is a really good lesson here. It was amazing the level of interest in this variety at that time. All people wanted to talk about is when is the Russian wheat aphid resistant version of Akron coming? And I'm, and I'm like, I didn't have tenure yet, right? So, so I'm like, oh, I, I just really tried to make sure I didn't mess it up, you know? So lo and behold, just the, the fall after we released Akron, we had the first of several new biotypes of Russian wheat aphid identified. And that was an interesting story in and of itself. I, I got a call from an aerial applicator and, and she was talking about, well, we're applying insecticide you know, with an airplane uh, to wheat varieties that are supposed to be resistant. What's happening here? And uh, we had a biotype shift in the Russian wheat aphid population. And this is a photo from our first screening going back to 2003. And uh, this here in the middle was a, a check that is still resistant. It carries a gene on a rye translocation from rye. And these ones here, are all the ones that were uh, our released varieties that carried this DN4 resistance gene. So in our initial screening, okay, like we have a problem and we're gonna have to work a little bit harder here. We did find a number of re new resistant sources and, and uh, this one actually, we, we uh, did some genetic mapping of this resistance and that was published in Crop Science, but, but um, kind of make a long story short, the Russian wheat aphid was a problem that became a non-problem. And uh, that again is a whole nother uh, seminar in and of itself, but um, just over time, the environment, or I, maybe I should say predators and parasites became adapted. They caught up with the Russian wheat aphid and just over time, they were able to keep um, the, the problem in check. And so after the new biotype was identified, we never released a, 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 a variety that was resistant to the new biotype, though we worked really hard at it for quite a number of years. So lo and behold, there's an expression that nature abhors a vacuum. And um, even though Russian wheat aphid became a non-objective for us over time, other things came in to fill that, fill that void. And the first of, of those was stripe rust. Wheat has three rust pathogens leaf rust, stem rust, and stripe rust. And, and stripe rust comes first. They, they all have different temperature thresholds for you know optimal temperature thresholds for, for generating new spores. And stripe rust is the one that has the lower temperature thresholds. So at our higher elevations in the high plains region, if we have moisture and we have a susceptible variety and we have inoculum, we can really get hit very hard. And so, so um, uh, interestingly, that prior to 2001, stripe rust was not a breeding objective of any breeding program in the Great Plains region from, from Texas to Montana. And, and now stripe rust, uh, you know, is probably the most important breeding objective for some of them. So, so again, nature abhors a vacuum. This slide just shows uh, kind of our, our uh, you know, emphasis, I guess, or opportunities that we had for screening for stripe rust resistance. Greenhouse screening does not work so well. And, and so we kind of relied on natural infections. And we had activity in 2001, 2003, 2005, 2007. You see kind of little spikes in each of those years. And, and so we were thinking 2009, we'd have a problem again, and we didn't. And then in 2010, we had a major problem and, and we had a race change in the stripe rust pathogen at that time. 
And that took out, when I say took out, it rendered uh, germplasm in all of the breeding programs in the Great Plains susceptible, essentially overnight. And um, so everybody had to work real hard. We all had good resistance in our programs. Otherwise, we had another race change in 2012. About, you think back to that slide of the wheat varieties from a little bit ago. In 2011, we released this variety bird. It was resistant when we released it and it was susceptible to the, to the new race that emerged in 2012. 2015, we had a perfect storm of, um, of uh, susceptibility, just cool, wet weather during the time of infection. And, and I think at one point we estimated about 25% of the crop was lost to stripe rust that year. And so, um, so that has been something we've been having to deal with. And I'm sure my, my successor will have to keep dealing with that. I will say that that's probably a pretty easy breeding objective compared to this one. The wheat stem sawfly is an insect pest that I think is now the, the program's top priority aside from just intrinsic grain yield improvement. Um, we saw this problem coming. And, and when I say it, it's not as if the insect moved from the Northern Great Plains from Montana and Canada, it's not like the insect moved to Colorado. The insect is, is native to Colorado but the insects that were here, they adapted. And it was probably some combination of reduced tillage practices, climate change, whatever. But uh, now this is a, an enormous problem. So yield from this insect pest can be reduced up to 50%. Um, reports in the literature are maybe 20 to 25%. But when you talk to farmers, they say, oh no, that this field was 50%. So um, problem number one. Problem number two, this insect cuts the stem. And I'll show you a photo here in a minute. It cuts the stem, makes it more difficult for the, for the wheat producer to pick the wheat up. So harvest efficiency is reduced. Problem number two, those are bad, right? Those are really bad. It's hard on the equipment. The worst problem though is, is what this does to persistence of the, of the wheat crop residue. And um, over the last 30, 40 years, um, rotations in eastern Colorado have diversified, where in many cases the producer will plant a spring crop after the winter wheat, and, and they rely on that crop residue to store moisture from, from snow. But the wheat stem soft like cuts the, cuts the residue, it all blows away, and so producers are reporting like maybe up to 10 bushel lower dry land corn yield in eastern Colorado from the damage to the wheat the prior year. So this is an enormous problem. And the, 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 the thing that makes it a really big problem is there's just really no magic, no silver bullets for this. Insecticides are not effective. There are parasitoids, which, which uh, are effective, but, but like the parasitoids on the Russian wheat aphid, they haven't figured it out yet in Colorado. They will, but it's gonna take time. And uh, different kinds of agronomic measures are partially effective and genetic resistance is partially effective. So this has become uh, objective number one in the breeding program. These are some maps showing, th these are the Eastern Plains of, of Colorado. You see where I'm up here in Fort Collins, Denver's here. And you know the Nebraska border and Kansas border is out here to the right of each of these diagrams. And um, the, the red dots and the orange dots indicate fields where we have greater problems. 2012 was the first survey, a lot of yellow dots. 2015, more orange dots, more red dots continuing into 2017. And then this is the, the, uh, the survey map from just this past year. So, so this is expanding in frequency expanding in distribution, but then expanding also in terms of the district, the uh, severity of the problem in any given field. So we, like any self-respecting breeding prog program, we work very hard to try to incorporate resistance from, we didn't have the resistance in the program uh, like we did for stripe rust. We had not, we, I had started making crosses in about 2009, 2010, didn't really get anything out of those. And um, which is another good, good lesson about breeding. It's, it's very tough to breed for things that aren't problems yet, but you better be trying to do it because if they're not problems today, they will be tomorrow. So uh, we started uh, kind of ramping up um, 
the crossing uh, efforts back in 2011, 2012, derived lines from sources of resistance from Montana. And then, um, and then as soon as we possibly could, recycled though, what I call recycling. Many breeders will, will talk about recycling, deriving lines, and then putting those back into our crossing program. So you see here going back to just uh, this past year, um, probably 30 to 40% of the, of the crossing program in that year was derived to germplasm um, that carries some resistance to the wheat stem soft fly. Never have, I uh, see may, maybe in the case of fusarium head blight in wheat, Right, I, I would argue that never have we seen a breeding program have to change orientation so fast as, as we had to. So we, um, using double haploid breeding technologies, we released a variety a year ago uh, called Fortify SF. The, this was derived with doubled haploids. And this is the cutting that I was talking about here. This is a susceptible variety that was like 85% cut and then here's our new Fortify SF, which is like 20% cut. So, so this is just the first effort. And, and again, I think my successor is going to be having to deal with this until he retires from the program. So let's talk a little bit now about other kinds of technologies. We've talked about breeding objectives and how those have changed. So uh, technology changed over these uh, over these years too in a lot of different ways and that's been really it's real as i said before it's really interesting for me to look back at these now with a maybe a little bit clearer lens than i had at the time this is a photo taken back in the early 2000s showing one of our plot combines and um uh you know we it was pretty advanced at the time i showed you the photo of of my my successors uh of my predecessor breeders you know one of those didn't even have these, right? And, and they used to go out and harvest everything by hand. So we at least had plot combines, but this technology changed. Um, you know, we used to harvest into paper bags, right? And then we had uh, out in the field, a weighing station. We had, you know, computerized balances, no barcodes, but we had uh, computerization out in the field. And this was pretty advanced for the time I felt. And, um, but, Technology changed. This was the first of, of uh, the combines that we had with on combine weighing systems, uh, Harvest Master grain gauge systems, single person operation, computerized data capture, right? And then the sample can be dumped or, or saved. So, so uh, we've used these for, I don't know, 10, I guess it probably close to 15 years. And then this is a photo of the new combine that we just purchased this past summer. And then now my, my successor has another one coming. So, you know, air conditioning, you know, uh, better sample throughput. We're told that this will be able to harvest plots in half the time on a per plot basis, half the time that it took uh, prior to this time. So, so I have every expectation that over time, right, this technology will, will change too. What we used this for over the years was to kind of rethink our field trialing uh, scheme. And when I came to CSU in 1999, as, as indicated here, our breeding program had four locations with the stars, one, two, three, four dry land locations out in eastern Colorado, uh, together with our main irrigated location at, at Fort Collins. Uh, we expanded that testing even, even before we got the first of our on-combine weighing systems, added a couple locations after our bad drought of 2002. And then since 2007, with additional support from the growers, we expanded that more. And uh, you know, along the lines of that expansion is, is not just expanding the numbers of testing sites that we, that we um, uh, where we test, and, and uh, I'm not going to put up the, the, the breed, so-called breeder's equation or the genetic gain equation here, but, but locations are important, right? But also as important as testing more individuals. And so a lot of what we've done along this time too is reducing replication and using mixed linear models to develop better and spatial analysis to develop, to be able to get better data from these field trials. So I wanted to show you a little bit about how some of those changes were, were uh, put into effect in the program over the years. This was the so-called breeding pipeline that we had when I took over the program in 1999. 
program was making about maybe 400 crosses a year. We expanded that quite a bit. Testing materials in bulks. This is essentially how any inbred line development program works, right? We make crosses, develop genetic variability, develop inbred lines, and then test them, right? So you'll see that a lot of that we expanded then from 2020, our so-called conventional pipeline, we had doubled the numbers of lines that we're testing. The uh, time frame from testing also has changed a lot from 10 to 12 years of my predecessor down to nine to 10 years here by, uh, by, by developing lines faster and just testing them in different ways. So the next thing that really changed for us was was having adequate funding to be able to get into developing doubled haploids. And um, this is the person that manages our doubled haploid facility here at CSU, Minakshi Santra. And uh, we uh, developed this back in 2014, I guess it was. And um, this is, you know, in essence, a tissue culture based procedure where you grow the F1 plant, pollinate it with maize pollen. And that doesn't work, right? Sometimes we, we talk about this procedure to producers and they go, you do what? You cross it with maize, how's that work? So, uh, but that induces a, an immature embryo to, to uh, develop. We excise that, put it in tissue culture, regenerate a haploid plant and then treat that plant with colchicine to double the chromosome number. So, so um, this has revolutionized our program at CSU. And uh, so what I thought might be um, most useful would be to look to see how, uh, how, how I've looked at that in terms of the pipeline. So this is the, the so-called conventional pipeline that I just showed you. And then here's the so-called fast track pipeline that we've implemented going back to around 2015, 2016. And uh, one of the things, first thing you ought to notice is that we were talking about a nine to 12 year time frame based on a conventional pipeline. We have now released varieties at six years after the cross is made, right? So that, that's important. We've been able to respond faster to grower concerns, but in doing this, we've essentially doubled the size of the program where we have uh, you know, 3000 new lines going to the field each year, 500 new lines going into yield trials uh, each year. And this could only have happened, right, by having better combines and better statistical tools to allow us to reduce replication so that we could still get good data from, from these field trials. So the other thing that's really important then in a breeding context is how fast can you cross with, with uh, germplasm that, that you've developed? We wanna make that as fast as possible. And uh, so these next two slides show um, kind of reinforce some of these things that I've talked about in terms of the time from the crosses made to release. I, I showed you on that prior, prior couple of slides, we were averaging right roughly maybe 10 years. And this is, this is a chronological arrangement of the varieties going back to anchor that I showed you at the, at the outset of the presentation. We had about 10 years that take us to develop a variety shorten that up to you know around six years, six to seven years, depending on the variety. And uh, but the thing that's most important and I and I'm I'm hoping right that my my successor will will reap the benefits of this is the reduction in the cycle time that we've been able to achieve in the program. Going from so the time that you make a cross, you derive a line, and then you return that line to the crossing program. That would be the cycle time. We were on roughly, you know, eight, depending on the variety, roughly an eight year cycle time. And we've cut that in half. Sometimes a little bit faster, sometimes not quite as fast, but roughly we've cut it in half. So, so right, you think back to the genetic gain formula, again, all things being equal, we should be able to double our rate of genetic gain. Of course, not all things are equal. So my, my successor will have to deal with a lot of things going forward in terms of genetic diversity and so forth. Okay, so those are some of the tools that have changed. And let's talk now a little bit more about molecular marker technologies. Haven't really talked about that at all. But, uh, you know, of, of all the things, I, you know, I got, I got my start, you know, back in my postdoc working with rapid markers in beans back in the, the early 1990s. Anybody remember what a rapid marker is? 
And um, it worked really good in beans, but in wheat, it didn't work. And um, it, it, it took wheat a long time to catch up in terms of genomics capacity. But I think wheat has caught up, at least in terms of us being able to use this and apply breeding now. So, so I wanted to just kind of walk you through a couple of slides here, looking at our variety Snowmass. This is a hard white wheat variety. It has been called the most famous wheat variety in the world, which I find that hard. I don't, that's not true. There are other more famous ones, but people have told me it's uh, really well known. And uh, one of the reasons it's really well known is, is hard white wheat is useful for uh, whole grain flour products. And um, Snowmass back in two, starting 2010, 2011 was the basis for our first ConAgra mills and then Ardent mills to, um, to, to develop a whole new line of flour products. And the one in particular that I would highlight here is ultra grain high performance, which was made exclusively from snow mass. So an identity preserved uh, marketing and production system had to be um, developed for this. Uh, others had, de had developed similar systems in the past, but this was an entirely new one. And um, growers were getting paid an extra 40 to 80 cents a bushel to deliver this wheat. And so that was fun to be involved with. But, but the, the basis of this interest was, a, was one of the high molecular weight glutenin genes. You think about it in terms of economics, like a, you know, a, a, a flour mill in Denver or a flour mill in Kansas, for them to import spring wheat, high quality spring wheat from North Dakota, that costs a lot of money. If they could source that from the Central Plains, there would be a lot of money to be made. And that was really the, uh, one of the major uh, basis of this program. So we knew that this, um, this uh, gene existed it's a high molecular weight glutenin gene on chromosome 1b of wheat. And um, kind of a funny story, I, I took one of my first sabbaticals. I learned about this gene. I got back from my sabbatical in 2006 and started to back cross this gene from this Canadian variety into one of our popular varieties at that time, Ripper. And we published a, a paper on that. Lo and behold, we had that gene in our germplasm. And, and again, seren serendipity, um, but we didn't really have the tools. We didn't know what it was, but this is a polyacrylamide gel showing that we were able to um, you know, distinguish this on a polyacrylamide gel. The uh, snow mass is our variety here, has the same, same type here as Glenlee, and then all of the other ones have this other, this other pattern. But we weren't going to be screening thousands of breeding lines with polyacrylamide gels. Um, fortunately, this, this technology worked on an ABI. Some of us may still remember ABIs and we could, we could uh, you know, uh, detect the, 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 not wild type, but the non-carrier hatcher from the uh, carrier snow mass. And then we, as DNA sequencing technology came about, we were able to then extend that to cast, cast marker technologies. That you see here, snow mass, those two, and Glenlea, that gene or the expression of that gene, I'm not a molecular biologist, so bear with me, but that phenotype is confer conferred by a 43 base pair overexpression of, the, of that gene. And it makes the dough really strong. And uh, it was kind of complicated, but we developed a CASP marker assay for that. And um, those have, those have been, been uh, published, but Cas marker technology is just, you know, you, you, you go back to, you know, running agarose gels and polyacrylamide gels, and then you think forward to cast markers, that's pretty neat. And um, so this is what this looks like on the, uh, on the, on the cluster collar software. It's a dominant marker, but we're able to determine the ones that had the snow mass type glutenin from the ones that didn't. And so that was kind of really our first that's probably going back, I don't know, 12, 10, 10, 12 years now where we're able to do this. And, and we've since been able to take this a little bit further. And one of the ways that we've been able to take it further is with whole genome sequencing. And uh, this is a slide that I think many people have, have seen just demonstrating over time how the costs of sequencing have, have decreased. And, and they've decreased to the point where we can now use this in wheat breeding.
and not just wheat, right, but many other crops. So we've been using this procedure genotyping by sequencing, and I think probably many people are familiar with this. Just a really cool idea, you know, that somebody came, came up with of ligating these little barcodes to little pieces of DNA, sequencing that, and then somebody at Buckler and his group developed technology to be able to do the bioinformatics from, from those gobs and gobs and gobs of data. So I, I call this a journey. Uh, we started this back in 2012, and uh, we, we just started with 384 individuals. We didn't really know how we were going to use this in the breeding program. I, I think we estimated at that time this was costing us about $19 an individual with the next generation sequencing. There was a lot of missing data at that time. And the, uh, the, the evolution that we've seen is that uh, by now, we've done about 25,000 individuals. And, and that's not each year we do 25,000, it's 25,000 total. And I, I think my successor is doing at least that many, uh, another maybe five or 6,000 this year. We're getting more SNPs and um, the cost has gone down and the degree of missing data has gone down. So over here on the left side of the slide depicts some of the changes in the technology that's occurred in terms of survey uh, you know, going from a survey sequence to a full reference genome that we have now for wheat. And now, now we have a pan genome in wheat, right? And, uh, but then also coming along in parallel has been just changes in the sequencing technology where we started at 96 individuals in one sequencing reaction. We call it 96 plex. Now we're doing 384 at a time. And so this shows the numbers of markers that we get. And I, I think back to, you know, graduate students back in the day, slaving away in the lab, running microsatellites on a double haploid population. Jan Ming remembers this, right? And, um, and how this has become um, not a problem at all. So we've used this in a number of different ways. Our initial focus in this was genomic selection. And this was the, the diagram from Elliot Hefner's paper back in 2009. I remember in my plant reading class asking a student to present this because I didn't understand <laughs> what they were talking about. And uh, so I had a student present this and um, oh, it made a little bit better sense. And then within two or three years, right, we were, we were doing this full scale in our breeding program which I, I think was pretty neat. But the idea being that you can predict phenotypes from un, on unphenotyped individuals by virtue of having a training panel of individuals that have both genotypes and phenotypes, right? So there's a number of different things that you have to have to make this work. And, um, and we've learned a lot. I've learned a lot over the, over the, the process and um, just wanted to show you a couple of quick, quick slides on this. Um, this has revolutionized our program, but probably not in ways that I was hoping. It's really still not that e effective for yield, but one of the things that's really effective for is quality traits. And here's a picture from our, we have our own wheat quality lab at CSU. And you just think one of these loaves, right? This is one variety grown at one location in one year. What does it take to get the data on that loaf of bread? You have to plant the trial. You have to harvest the trial. You have to bring the grain back. You have to clean the grain. You have to mill it. You have to bake it. A lot of people involved, a lot of time involved. Remember, we plant winter wheat in September and harvest it in July. And um, just to get that one data point, it's, it's an enormous investment. And this shows a, a prediction accuracy for the primary trait that's of interest to us, which is the, the volume of that loaf. You notice here, some of these differ in terms of size, like this one right here is smaller than that one. So we have a device that measures the volume of that. And that's a very important trait for us in wheat breeding. And this shows a cross validation accuracy for loaf volume, where the accuracy of that prediction the correlation between the predicted value and the actual value is 0.63. And um, not perfect, right? But probably good enough to identify the really, really poor ones. You can throw them away. And, and then this right here shows 
a panel of individuals from a breeding trial in this coming season in 2021, where we don't have that phenotype yet. We won't have the phenotype on those individuals until another, to like next year. It takes that long. And we're able to develop a prediction on those individuals. The, they're all at the same place on the X axis, X, X axis because we don't have the phenotype. And so we're able to at least rank genotypes with some degree of accuracy. And then this is another slide showing prediction accuracy for the degree that the wheat is cut by the wheat stem sawfly. And, and this is higher. There's, there's some major genes involved here that control this. And um, so we're able, again, to rank individuals that are in yield trials even before we're able to observe that phenotype in the field. So I, I, I call this um, you know, revolutionary in terms of how we might apply this in breeding. So let's talk about GWAS a little bit now and, and uh, you know, genome-wide association analysis. This, this for me was always something like, well, that's fine. It just kind of seemed like it was an extension of QTL mapping. How do I use this in breeding? And, and in a very short period of time, this has become an enormously powerful tool in breeding. Right, And so this is a problem that I had mentioned before, this virus, the wheat streak mosaic virus that is transmitted by this mite. And uh, the mite doesn't only transmit that virus, it transmits a couple of others, but working with that mite is really difficult. And um, you can mechanically inoculate plants with the virus, and we've done a lot of that, but again, that's pretty labor intensive. The, the control options aren't really very good. You try to tell a wheat farmer to delay planting and they laugh at you. <laughs> so, so really what we need is host plant resistance. And there's a couple of major genes that we have, but really what we lacked over the years was, was uh, getting data from field trials. So I, I say serendipitous field epidemics. We got one in 2017. I spent about six hours at this, this, and a couple of other field trial locations scoring, you know, a whole field of, of individuals for wheat streak mosaic virus. And uh, I went to the hotel room that night and I did a GWAS. And uh, I was so proud of myself, right? Like, like this old guy, right? And I was able to take the data, right? And, and before I went to bed that night, I did a GWAS that that validated the phenotype that I saw out in the field. So I have talked about the wheat streak resistance as well as the resistance to the mite that transmits the virus. And that's what's shown on this GWAS here. There's a major gene on chromosome 6D that's prevalent in our germplasm, which mitigates the spread of, or the uh, colonization of plants by, this, uh, by the mite, which then reduces the, the uh, infection due to the virus. And then there's a major gene for resistance to the virus itself, which is also prevalent throughout our germplasm. So I saw this and it's just like, yes, I thought it was, I was just really excited about this. Over time, we started to look at this in a little bit of different ways because we have not got this happened again. That was 2017, it hasn't happened again, but we're able to leverage past phenotypic data for forward breeding activities. And, and so based on the, the uh, GWAS that I showed in the prior slide, we're able to parse out haplotypes, if you will, in kind of a crude way, I'll admit, I'm not much uh, for bioinformatics, but uh, we're able to parse out haplotypes surrounding these two loci. And uh, this shows a, a collection of different individuals over here on the left, and you can see over, over here are scores that we have of individuals for the wheat streak mosaic virus phenotype, which was my eye scoring them. And green is, they looked really good. And red, they looked really susceptible. And um, so we're able to see, okay, these individuals that all look pretty resistant, well, some of them are resistant because it looks like they have the gene that the green here indicates it carries the allele which statistically is associated with a lower phenotypic value. So these individuals are resistant, presumably because they have the gene for wheat streak resistance, whereas these individuals 
are more likely resistant because they have a gene for resistance to the curl mite. We're able to look at a group of individuals here where you see they're all pink, right? Presumably they don't carry any resistance source, but you see there's some variation among them in terms of their response. And um, so that provides more information that you can use to try to flesh that out. The thing that's most powerful though, I look two things. One is we're able to identify individuals now in the breeding program that have both. And this one that you see here, this Colorado 13D0787, this was released this past year um, as Guardian. And um, it's the first wheat that carries both of these resistance genes. And we've seen this work in the field. And so, so now we're able to use that information to identify individuals that have that in the absence of the phenotype, right, as we see here. So here's a group of individuals from breeding trials that we don't have the phenotype, but we have phenotypes from past records that we can plug into the GWAS and, uh, and derive information that's meaningful for breeding, I, I feel. So this shows we've, you know, doing the same thing for uh, wheat stem sawfly. There's a major gene on chromosome 3B that confirms that, that confers a gene associated with the sawfly resistance. But now using GWAS, we're able to identify other chromosomal regions that affect cutting. And right, you, I, I think back to the early part of my career, right? You see a phenotype, you have no idea <laughs> what it's from. And, and uh, unless it's just like one major gene, but you know, right, we, we understand from genetics now that things, things most often aren't quite that simple. Okay, so I'm not sure how I'm doing for time, Jen Ming, but I, I just have this last slide, some closing thoughts and coming back to this idea of the only constant in life is change. And um, now that my career is over, at least my professional career, you know, I, I look at how things changed for us over time. And I, I fully expect that my successor will experience these same uh, changes and, and attendees on the seminar will, will, will experience these. Or, you know, the things we worked on in the breeding program, that changed in dramatic ways. How we approached, right, the nuts and bolts of breeding in terms of field trials, more entries, more trial locations, mixed linear models, spatial analysis, all geared towards greater gain. Our breeding methods changed. There's not a breeding method used in self-pollinated crops that we haven't used to develop a wheat variety. And um, then in terms of more modern technologies, the DNA markers, you know, I've, under, I've underlined rapid evolution there, right? But, you know, we, we waited a long time, right, for these technologies to come of age. And, you know, people in wheat would lament, you know, oh, the genome's too big and, you know, we don't have enough polymorphism and all this stuff. And, you know, but it's here now and uh, faster, cheaper, better. And we all know that next year it's going to be faster, cheaper, and even better. And then, and then the genomics, you know, trait prediction. I was really excited to, to see Jan Ren's work on, you know, integrating other technologies with the prediction. And uh, I have every expectation that my successor will make me look like you know, like the breeder from the dark ages, right? <laughs> and so um, it's just really exciting to me to see, to see um, you know, the pace of change that we have today. So some things that uh, I would like to maybe reflect on here is that some of these changes that I've talked about, you know, were forced on me. I didn't choose to work on wheat stem sawfly or stripe rust, right? There were other things, you know, like genomic selection. That was a change for our program that I chose. We chose, right? And, um, you know, why did we choose that? You know, I was just never comfortable, right, with where we were. I, I, I always felt competition and competition is good. And um, so being uncomfortable and unsatisfied has its advantages. And I would argue that being comfortable and satisfied and, and satisfied has its disadvantages. And, and we've all known people that won't change. And if you don't change, your fate will even be surer in the future than it was in the, than it was in the past. It'll happen faster. So, you know, but changing required us to learn new things. It wasn't just me, I had good people. We had to put in a lot of time. 
it wasn't always re really clear how we were going to do this, but we said we need to try. And um, it's just fun, fun for me to look back to see we weren't always patient, right? Don't get me wrong here, but um, it worked. And um, I don't know, I, I feel good about that. So that, that adoption cycle was not linear. You know, you, you, okay, we learned how to extract DNA in a 96 well format. Okay, that was, that was big, right? But then to the end of, you know, like learning how to use R, who was going to do that? And um, so we learned things along the way that we didn't know when we started. And I guess that was part of the fun of it, right? So the last thing I would just say is that there were some things that, that we had to have, and I was really lucky to have them. One was I wanted to make things better to serve the grower in Colorado better. And I had good people and I had good funding from the growers. And I tell you, you, you have those things. And, um, and uh, you know, you could do a lot of good, you could do a lot of good things over time. So uh, not sure how I've done with time, Jen Ming, but uh, this is uh, just a quick acknowledgement slide. I commented about the funding from the university, from our grower groups, and uh, from Ardent Mills. I've, I've really lived a very charmed existence and working with very good people and, and very good collaborators from entomology, crops testing, weed scientists. Phil Westro was our co-developer on the coax coaxium trait and then Pat, Pat Byrne in the area of quantitative genetics. So with that, thank you very much. I appreciate all your attention. <laughs> yes, Pat, you have a question. Yeah, I do, Scott. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed this. Um, and I, you may, uh, if you've ever read children's stories to to kids, the little red hen popped into my head when you were talking about uh, producing the grain for your loaf uh, phenotyping. Yeah, I remember that one. <laughs> yeah, but. So my question has to do, I looked at your variety names and they're really interesting and some of them are very compelling, but maybe you could say a few words about your philosophy or strategy for naming varieties. Wow. So um, that has also been a very nonlinear path, right? When I, when I first started, you know, I, it, my wife came up with some, right? I came up with some. Uh, at one point, I had a I had a, a database, an online database, where farmers could go in and enter their name, right? So they didn't have to stick their face out. And um, uh, over time, things changed because our marketing organization, the Colorado Wheat Research Foundation, started to take a little more active role. And and like I'd propose a name, and they go, "Oh, that's the dumbest name we've ever heard," you know. And so so over the last three or four years it's come where, okay, I'll have a suggestion and they take, they pick a different name that, um, that, that they think will contribute to more successful marketing in that variety. So back, back when I was picking them, um, oh, there's just a lot of, a lot of memories there. Um, some, some of them were named after people and um, bird was without question our most successful variety. And that was named after uh, Bird Curtis, who was our first wheat breeder. Um, Langan was named after a extension agronomist. So, <laughs> some of them were jokes. So we released a variety in 2004 called Bond CL. It was actually the first double haploid wheat released in the United States, uh, but it was a clear field wheat. But its, its experimental number was 007. And so, right, so we named it Bond CL. And then Ripper is another one that was kind of a joke. I had, I had just gotten back from sabbatical in Australia and they had this expression in Australia, um, something was a ripper, you know, as a ripper, which means something that's really good. And so I, I called it, uh, you know, a ripper, right? So. So it was all sorts of different kinds of things, but over, over time that, that changed quite a bit. My wife came up with some good ones and I think I did too. I came up with some duds also. Good, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, 
actually, I never heard your presentation in the past, uh, mm. but we had a few lunches together and I always enjoy talking with you. Mm. Uh, you know, from my lunch discussion, I expect you have a wonderful presentation in the first oh. place. So that was Thank absolutely uh, very interesting. Uh, can you share a little bit about your experience with R? <laughs> You know, to encourage students uh, on programming side a little bit more, yeah. That's also been an evolution. So, um, so I I hired a postdoc in about um, gosh, when when was that? It was probably around 2007, maybe 2008 or nine, something along like that. And and he was from Spain, and he he knew how to use R. I don't think I had even heard of R. And he was trying to show me things, and and you know I was always uh, into database programming, I, and I still am. And um, but I, I still didn't. He he tried to get me into it, and I was like, oh, who has time for that? And then and then I hired is like our first graduate students that that I brought on to work on genomic selection. And you know we didn't have anybody here. You know the the Spanish guy left, and that there was nobody else here to do this, right? And so the first was the graduate students and, and they went off and learned it. And, you know, Jesse Poland helped a lot, just providing us advice, like, okay, how do you learn R? And Jesse said, quit using SAS. And so my, my grad students took that on. And, um, uh, and then I, I just, uh, I took another sabbatical in 2013 to 2014 and I just felt at that time that the handwriting was on the wall for me, that if I was going to do an effective job advising students, I had to learn it myself. And so that's all I did for six months I was on sabbatical in Bologna and, and uh, in Norwich at John Innes Center. I just sat there and just, I, I learned enough R so that I could then, you know, keep learning. And um, so, so that was kind of an evolution. I'm, I'm still learning. And, um, you know, I re recently we had, uh, I, Jen, Jen Ran, I mentioned Kim Campbell, you know, Kim Campbell and I took a workshop in Python a couple of years ago, you know? <laughs> and I, I, I think, I think my, my um, the experience in database programming helped me learn R and, um, but, but anyway, I'm kind of belaboring the point. I, I just, that the reason I did was I, I just was, I wasn't old enough yet that I felt I could blow it off. And, um, and, and I thought, how am I gonna advise graduate students if I, if I can't do this? And so that's, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Perfect, that's great, thank you, yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question about uh, one of your first slides. You showed that there's no very little wheat grown in Iowa. And uh, I notice on that map that that zone sort of continues into Nebraska, into I Illinois, in the zone where we have lots of freeze thaw cycles. Um, and I just wonder if you have any thoughts. Maybe this is outside of uh, problems you've worked on, but I have. I'm curious if you have any thoughts about whether uh, anything could be done with breeding of wheat so that either perhaps a spring wheat or a winter wheat could be bred that would uh, do well in this zone. Well, um, you know, I think historically there have, there have been efforts, you know, in, in those areas. And, uh, you know, you even look at Nebraska, I mean, Gosh, when I, I started as a wheat breeder 27 years ago, you know, Nebraska had over 2 million acres of wheat, of winter wheat. And they, now they have like 700,000. And I, and I don't think that's been, I pretty confident in saying that that's not due to, um, you know, uh, limitations of winter injury for winter wheat or high temperatures for a spring wheat. You know, we, we've seen breeding programs in the center.